All right. For, again, I apologize that uh, uh, Kai Ville had to uh, had to cancel at the last minute. Um, what questions can we have for our two panelists? Please. Uh, start with Eric, sure. Um, I, I think I've read in uh, one of the ASE technical magazines about concrete that heals the fractures or cracks that can heal itself. Is, are you familiar with that or is that how many? I can try. <laughs> Uh, I mean, is there a specific question? Yes, I mean, concrete self healing concrete is has been around because Eric knows more about this for, for decades. Uh, um, there are a variety of ways that people, to, to my knowledge, there are a variety of ways that people do that. Um, concrete does heal itself to some degree, uh, based on, I mean, you, you do have, uh, as long as there's a crack and there's moisture. Uh, there is on typically there is unhydrated cement particles in concrete, which can still, you know, dissolve and uh, you can still produce, you know, calcium hydroxide, which fills the void essentially. You can also form calcium silicate hydrate. Um, of course, if you have a pozzolanic concrete, then the material, the, the, the environment is more conducive to formation of calcium silicate hydrate, which is a desirable part of um, the hydration process. But people have tried to use. Uh, very, very clever, other clever ways to self heal concrete, uh, uh, including using uh, bacteria that uh, can help precipitation of uh, products and so on. Yeah, the, the primary function is to close the cracks, not so much for strength issues, but for uh, clo close these super highways for uh, ingress uh, of chlorides and so forth. Uh, I'm just going to say it's hard to hear if you could speak up uh, for for Drew. Why N E U? What is that reason for that title? And seems like the amount of membership you you know the the, the way you formatted it just kind of puts universities out of the picture. So I wanted to see if you could comment on that. Yeah, so first off, I uh, knew the title was created uh, months before I came on board, but I think the the, the thought behind it was uh, capitalizing on neutral and carbon neutral, um, the NEU and neutral, and they wanted to focus on the neutral part of it for a few different reasons. One, the carbon neutral aspect of, of what we're doing, but also emphasizing that we are looking to be a neutral source of information and, and material agnostic, for lack of a better term. And so you're going to question I know you're new to the job, so you may not have an answer for this, but I just wondered, how do you know when you arrive at carbon neutral? That's a really good question. In fact, we're, we're putting together our positioning right now on exactly what we mean by carbon neutrality. Um, because I think as we get more data and more information, those goals and those specific targets are going to change. Um, as an industry, those things are going to change as we get better at what we're doing. So I, I personally don't see a specific date or a specific uh, measurable, ben measurable benchmark right now. But as we get better with carbon accounting and better with the data that we do have from a local aspect, I think those targets will get more realistic. That's very abstract, but that's the best I have right now. Well, it's not. It's not quite. Uh, it's, it's sort of in line with you were talking about uh, earlier that some of these things are very difficult to to quantify based on the, what we now know. Questions, Sebastian. So the last century, um, engineering made a big effort to standardize the design of concrete structures, right? And we came up with very nice and simple methods to make prismatic sections, right? We evaluate the moments and shears on critical sections. And we build our structures to sustain uh, those loads that are at very specific points. And we have to waste a lot of materials on other sections that do not need it. And today you just talk about uh, different methods to save that amount of material. So my question is, 
based on what you know and what you think, how likely it is that we move from these standard design methods uh, that are, let's say, like pretty constrained to a more flexible method that allow us to optimize this geometry of the structure in every single aspect? complex question but I, <laughs> I think that's what we're all trying to get towards right we're all trying to get towards uh taking what we've created in the past and applying it to all the new and different ways we need to be utilizing the best practices moving forward so to answer your question in short yes i think we're, we're headed that way and we're going that direction when it'll happen i i don't know but i think that we're that's that's our that's what we're striving for is is a uh, more flexibility with what we're able to do with the knowledge that we already have. I mean, uh, I'll take a little bit of a stab at that one, uh, Sebastian, because there's a lot of work being done on on uh, optimizing structural shapes, kind of from a theoretical standpoint. Exactly what you're saying. Where, where do we need material and where don't we? I think the uh, um, hang up to date is well okay we can make this very exotic shape that we really optimize for the structure but how do you make it uh how do you how do you build it and in fact that's so much is going to cost especially where the additive manufacturing uh could play a role is because really what they've been talking about is a material from the materials perspective uh what you're talking about is really from the structural perspective and of course the reality is they all have to work together uh, if we're going to achieve some of these uh, these goals, so, I don't know. Does that seem reasonable? Yeah, with me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's the. I think maybe your question is pointed at standardization. Is that the true characterization? More or less. I, I was thinking we we really want to depart from that standardized methods and move to a more flexible and more complicated design process. And how, how is that going to that? I, I mean, I, I, um, I envision some uh, ACI code on how to build these things. Right. I mean, the short answer is that you have to start somewhere, right? So the concrete yeah. has been around for more than 100 years. It's, there's a standard for it now because it has been around for, for such a long time. But when Romans built, the, built their temples or their, their, their uh, their structures there there wasn't a standard i would assume there was probably some instructions but there wasn't a standard but it still is lasting so you don't necessarily need a standard for lasting structures the reason we have a standard in our society is that we are modern society and we're a litigious society that we cannot be drew i think talked about um uh risk averse is that the term yeah uh, nobody wants to, simply nobody wants to be to be sued right so that's why we have standards. One, the other most important aspect we have standards is to save lives. Okay? So there has been more disasters where we have lost the structures and people more recently has been one. Um, people talking about corrosion. So the standards are, are, are present for, for other reasons. It does not prevent us from becoming, you know, making innovative. Uh, coming up with new ideas and, and trying them and keep the decision. One last question. Anyone came? Ah, yes. So uh, this question is for Professor uh, Moini. Very interesting uh, presentation. So my question about the three D printing concrete that uh, uh, how can it be reinforced by rebar? I know you have already mentioned that in your side, it's one of the current challenge in 3D printed concrete structure, but we know that fiber cannot be used to replace the rebar for the structural level application. Uh, I know it's challenging, but what's uh, at, at the current stage, what's the best way or what's a promising approach to install the reinforcement for 3D printed concrete structure? Uh, that's a very good point. Um, Presently, it's extremely challenging to embed reinforcement into the uh, as layer by layer additive manufacturing process. However, people still have tried to use additive manufacturing while coming up with conventional structures, which has led to 3D printing essentially the, the walls as the formwork, and um, whether using reinforcement and casting concrete into it, so essentially using 3D printing as, as a mold, which can stay in place. 
uh, or uh, coming up with uh, essentially depositing you know layers of um, reinforcement in every you know several layers in between the deposit of concrete. Um, the the bigger the bigger picture is that we we don't have necessarily the, the tools to really understand how to come up with these reinforcement designs because again it goes back to fundamental response of concrete as long as we're going to think we have to have reinforcement in conventional ways and think of designing conventional ways then we have to solve conventional problems of how to embed incremental uh, advancements to how to embed reinforcement in the three of houses uh, people have tried to use to give you more a better answer, a little more extended answer. But people have tried to use external reinforcements with really thin infrastructure, but the reinforcement is uh, an ex external structure itself, right? Um, it's, it's a composite structure on its own. Uh, there are a number of different ways, and other other ways people have tried, but it's it's not necessarily. If as long as people think about conventional design, it's not going to be uh, easily solved. Thank you.